History. The name Ethiopia itself is Greek and means of burned face. Of burned face, Scott. It is first attested in the Homeric epics, but it is unlikely to have referred to any particular nation, but rather to people of African descent in general. So the term, when you look at many old maps, some of the maps would say Ethiopia for the entire continent. It's not until more recent they moved it to the uh, uh, west side of the continent. All right, from there, give me, thank you, take that off the screen. Give me Genesis 2, Genesis chapter 2. And let's start at verse 10. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. Write this down. The river that went out of Eden to water the garden is the Jordan River. The Jordan. Jo and write Joshua 3.15. I'm not reading that today, but I've gone over this several times before. Go ahead. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted. And became into four heads. Mm -hmm. The name of the first is Pison. The name of the first is Pison. Write this down. The Nile. The, they call it the White Nile. Go ahead. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Okay, read. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bdellium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. So Gihon, write this down, Blue Nile, the Blue Nile. Okay, go ahead. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. So write this down, Hidekel is the Tigris River, the Tigris. Go ahead. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Can you put the map uh, on the screen? Yeah, okay. So, let me look. Let me look. Get my eye on my bearings. All right. You got the White Nile. And you see the Blue Nile, top left. That's what I wanted to show you. The Blue Nile, which was, what was it? I mind this one. Boop, the Gihon. That's the one that goes through, encompasses the Ethiopia right there. All right. From there, from there. Give me Genesis 10 and 6. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 6. Mm -hmm. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. So now today we're going to talk about the sons of Ham. Cush, and Mizraim, and Put and Canaan. We're going to discuss. Read on. Verse 7. And the sons of Cush, Seba, 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 and Havilah, and, Sub, and Subta, and Ramah, and Subtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Hey, put the next map up on the screen. All right. Now, y'all see where it says, uh, uh, no, that's, I want the, what is that it? Mm, no, it's not. Put the other map I gave you. There's a reason I wanted the other map. I appreciate you, though, but, uh. Put the other map I gave you. I need that other map because it, the, this map has a name that I want y'all to see. All right. Y'all see where it says Somaliland, right? Okay, okay. Put the other map up real quick, and then I'm going to reflect back to this one. Put the other map you just showed. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come, come. All right. Zoom in. All right. Y'all see Somalia, right? All right. You see... Berbessa, you see Erigavo. My eyesight ain't that good. What's that top one? Bo, Bo, Bosasso. What is it? Bosasso. Yeah, and down it says, thank you, Cordo and Garui. All right, so in Somalia. So now give me the other map. That's what I want you to look at. Y'all see it says Somaliland, but look at the tip. It says Puntland. Y'all see Puntland right there? Yes, sir. Now give me the next one about the land of Punt. Puntland. Right, zoom in. Closer. Read that, big man. Yes, sir. The land of Punt, Egyptian Punt, was an ancient kingdom known from ancient Egyptian trade records. It produced and exported gold, aromatic resins, blackwood, ebony, ivory, and wild animals. It is possible that it corresponds to Opone in Somalia, as later known by the ancient Greeks 
while some biblical scholars have identified it with the biblical land of Put, Put or Havilah. Or Havilah. Now, when we go back to Genesis 10, uh, we read, look at verse 6 again. Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. So Put is, that was what we just saw on the screen about the land of Punt, which is the tip of Somalia. They were at one time at North Africa. They got pushed out from there by the Arabs, and they went and dwelt in Somaliland, that, t that point that we just took a look at. Everybody with me so far? Yes, sir. All right, give me the Bible dictionary. We're still talking about the sons of Ham. All right, give me the next page. All right, can we read that? Yes, sir. This is the, Zond this is the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races. He became the father of the dark races. Go ahead. Not the Negroes. He's not the father of the Negroes. Okay, go ahead. But the Egyptians. But the Egyptians. Ethiopians. Ethiopians. Libyans. Libyans. And Canaanites. And Canaanites. All right. Go back to Genesis 10 and verse, I want verse 8 again. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So the Cushites begat Nimrod. Can you put the picture of uh, Nimrod up? The generated image of Nimrod? Yes. Read that again. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Read. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. When it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, I mean against the Lord. God, that's what it means. Go ahead. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginnings of his kingdom was Babel. So the Hamites had the first kingdom besides what Adam had established. The Hamites, Cush's son, was the first under Nimrod. Read verse 10 again. Verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. That's where Babylon comes from. Go ahead. And Erech, mm -hmm. and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. In the land of Shinar. All of this is taking place over in Iraq, modern-day Iraq. Go ahead. Verse 11, out of that land went forth ashore. So now, give me the next image when they built this tower. Okay. Get me that in Genesis 11. Genesis 11, start from there. One. Verse 1. Yep. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language. One language. And of one speech. Meaning they spoke every word the same. It was no, you say tomato, I say tomato. Wasn't that. Everybody pronounced every word the same. Go ahead. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Mm -hmm. and they That's dwelt, Iraq. Go ahead. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. So they wanted to build a tower that could reach the heavens. Go ahead. And let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So their mindset was to overthrow the one true God. Because remember what that occurred with the flood. Okay, go ahead. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be re restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to. Let us go down and there confound their languages, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Read. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. That's where the name Babel comes from, meaning confusion. Go ahead. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. All right. So from there, give me the video on the Nilotes, please. Give me the video on the Nilotes. The term Nilo Nilotes comes from the Nile River. These were indigenous Hamites that dwelt among the Nile River. Okay. IT? I don't know what that I often is. wondered where the vernacular for the racial categorization in the United States came from. I mean, are white people really white? Or are they more of a pinkish tan? Obviously, Asians wait, don't wait, have yellow wait. Was skin. Was that the beginning of the video? Yeah, okay, go ahead. 
I'm sorry. I'm sk- I'm looking at something. But go ahead. I often wondered where the vernacular for the racial categorization in Jump the United up a minute. States came from. Jump up I mean, a few seconds. I don't want to hear this. Even. <laughs> Jump up a little bit. Okay, <laughs> stop from there. A little cute little boy right there. Go ahead. To learn about that gets almost no attention in the Western world are the Nilotes of Sub-Saharan Africa, who almost appear to be a caricature of African features. The Nilotes are perhaps one of the most phenotypically unique people on the entire planet, with an almost universal appearance consisting of jet black skin, quite distinct facial features, and a tall and lanky frame, and even the Nilotic homeland in East Africa has a pretty cool shape. The features of this unique racial group is a consequence of their position. You know, when we envir- uh, pause it a second, we when we were in, you were with me in Uganda. You didn't go. With me, you want me in Uganda? There's like a, a a higher percentage of nilotes there, than like uh, Sierra Leone really didn't have a lot of nilotes, but Uganda had quite a bit. But that's what today's lesson about. I, there's something I want to show you. I want to reveal to y'all. Go ahead in the continent of Africa, lying in one of the hottest, most humid overall places in the world. And although there is no central unity among the Nilotes today, divided into countless subgroups, many had attained a strong presence in not only the history of Africa, but other parts of the world as well. So what exactly are the parameters for these Nilotic peoples? Why are they so distinct and of such great interest to human anthropologists? And what is the history behind the envoys and empires from this unique group of people that have been greatly neglected in the academic world? Naturally, the name for the Nilotic people, as well as the greater Nilo-Saharan language family, is derived from the Nile River, which is, of course, one of the longest in the world, stretching from Egypt and snaking its way down to Lake Victoria in the middle of East Africa, with the Nilotes mostly... These were the, I'm sorry, pause it. These were the rivers we were talking about today. The White Nile, you got the Blue Nile. This was the area where the Garden of Eden was, and further up towards Euphrates. The Garden of Eden extended there, but go ahead. White Nile and the fertile plains that surround it. Nilotes are the eastern half of the Nilo-Saharan peoples, which in itself is a bit of a dubious classification as it's incredibly difficult to classify many supposed Nilo-Saharan languages similar to the Khoisan family. Okay, and now you heard what he said, it's difficult to identify Nilotes due to language, so just keep that in mind. Go ahead. They're grouped together mostly for convenience sake, and it's been proposed that the group as a whole may actually be related to either the Niger-Congo or Afro-Asiatic language families, although no widely accepted conclusion has been accepted, either from an anthropological or linguistic view. The Nilotic group proper is spread out over several East African countries, but especially in South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia, and they are believed to have originated in the Upper Nile some 3,000 years ago and gradually spread south over the millennia, and most Nilotes have specific genetic markers such as haplogroup A and B, which are linked to other pre-Bantu populations. How long is this video? What minute? 11 minutes. We only go to 4 minutes. What time are you at now? All right, jump to three minutes, just for time's sake. The third, Color. Yeah. While their tall and slender frame is an adaptation that allows their bodies to expel heat quicker in the hot, humid savanna of Africa, as most know that thermal energy is radiated quicker as surface area increases. He's so in science, I'll tell you. Keep it going. Portion to volume. Although studies do vary, the average nilote is around six foot two, being six foot four for males and six foot for females, and records show that the Nilotes of South Sudan were actually even taller in the past than they are today, mainly because of malnutrition caused by famine and war. Wait, Paul, but- you hear that? they got taller because of malnutrition. That makes no sense. The white man is the devil the Bible speaks of. 